The late Floyd Sparky Sweet is credited with creating a breakthrough magnetic solid state motor. A magnetic specialist with a distinguished industrial career, Sweet was a man whose technical claims could not be easily dismissed. Many credible witnesses saw his device work and Toby Groats was able to photograph these demonstrations. This is Floyd Sweet's vacuum triode amplifier powering two 100 watt incandescent lamps and a small DC motor. The term vacuum triode amplifier or VTA is a word that was coined by Tom Bearden in order to explain the phenomenon of how energy from the zero point energy state was coupled into Floyd Sweet's over unity free energy device. The hardware configured in this photograph was set up and run producing in excess of over two million to one power gain. It's uh, definitely one of the outstanding examples of how zero point energy over unity devices can be made to actually function and work. What we have here is a motor that can run continuously forever because you run it on one stack of batteries and you charge up another. So this is a combination motor generator. This is what I'm into now. You have a little motor right here. Now the way the motor works, it's a pulse motor. So what you're doing is you're um, turning it on, making this electromagnet have power so it pushes the magnet away. So what I'm doing here, if anybody wants to know the circuit, is I take the uh, battery, put it into the coil, and then be just before it gets to ground, I put a switch on it so it turns on and off. And here's the switch right here. It's a magnetic reed switch. It's a switch that's controlled by a magnet going by it. This flame that happens inside this reed switch has a lot of power to it. It should have as much power in there going in, just coming out, because every time that coil turns off, uh, all the energy contained in the coil comes kicking back. Now, you can take that energy that kicks back and put it into a second battery and charge up a second battery. So now, there's this flame here, and to make it vanish, conventional electric motor bills will just ground it out or something. But what you want to do is you want to put a full wave bridge rectifier. It's this component you can get at Radio Shack for $1.50. It changes AC into DC. Look at that baby go. Here's the battery being charged here. Watch the volts on it. See, look at this. 12.65 already. 12.66, see it's going up. And it's gonna go all the way up. It's gonna go all the way up to 14 if you want. So a few days ago, I ran this motor for uh, 50 hours. And I rocked the batteries forth. I switched them back and forth about three or four times. And at the end, I still had like 12 point something volts and I could have gone a lot longer. So what this is, is a, it's a motor, I call it an over unity motor, in that you don't, you're, you're using so much power and you're always charging up another thing. So you never, you always have a stack of batteries being charged when you run out of your batteries on the other side of the system. It's like the simplest thing in the world. And it's a motor, which means you can turn a generator with it. And now all the electricity the generator makes is free. Or you can turn a water pump with it or anything you want, or a car. You can stack these, you can make 12 on a shaft if you want. So that's, a, that's what I'm looking to have is like a commercial unit people could buy in a store, something like this. Uh, just something that runs on car batteries, charges car batteries, and you have excess power with a generator to, to do whatever you want with. So it's free energy. Because <laughs> you don't have to pay for it. It's, it's just happening. It's free. Lonnie Johnson is what you would call a prolific inventor. The engineer holds more than 100 patents, inspired to create ever since he was a child. I was always curious about how things worked. I would take my siblings' toys apart to... Sometimes I put them back together. Sometimes I put, use parts to make something else totally different. When he was a teenager, Johnson won an engineering contest with a robot he built while growing up in the segregated South. We were the only black school represented, but Linux was such an impressive piece of work that we were able to walk away with first place. 
Years later, as an engineer for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, Johnson helped design the Galileo mission to Jupiter and the Mars Observer projects. But Johnson's biggest claim to fame was engineering this toy, the Super Soaker Squirt Gun. More than a billion dollars in sales later, Johnson had the resources to work on his real life's mission, finding ways to power the world without polluting it. That was my strategy because I was having a lot of trouble getting investors or people to support the research that I wanted to do in the hard science area. The engineer started two companies, located them in what was once a blighted Atlanta neighborhood, and hired fellow scientists to work on his mission. We've done some things at the research level that a lot of people have predicted were impossible and could not work. Johnson and his team spent seven years developing this lithium air battery. A battery, he says, provides ten times more energy than the most powerful batteries now on the market. Whereas the auto industry now is trying to get to 100 miles on a single charge, you'd actually be able to charge your car and drive uh, up to 1,000 miles on one charge nonstop. So that would eliminate the reservation that a lot of people have about electric cars. Johnson has tested the battery's ability in the lab time and again. But in order to get the battery to work in an electric car, it needs to be larger. And scaling it up takes big money. We could actually put it in a car and drive a car, I'd say 12 to 18 months if we had adequate funding. But Johnson says companies with far more resources are starting to catch up. Now we've got large entities like the National Laboratories and the IBMs and others who have very deep pockets are starting to focus on this technology. So we've got to run faster to stay ahead. The other potentially world-changing invention he's developed is this engine. The JTEC converts heat to electricity. Popular Mechanics Magazine awarded the JTEC its breakthrough prize in 2008. And the National Science Foundation has said the JTEC has, quote, a good chance of being the best thing on Earth. It took us a while to convince people that even the engine was real and it could work. Johnson says the engine, which pushes hydrogen through a membrane, could power entire cities once it's scaled up. If we had a way of converting heat from the sun to electricity as, as, as cost effectively as we can burn coal or, or gas or, or natural gas to produce electricity, then you know, we would be using the sun a lot more. This would really literally change the world if we're successful. Johnson has received some funding from the Department of Energy and support from the Department of Defense, but not enough to get the project commercialized. That, he says, will take several million dollars. Everything depends on resources. I could have an engine working in, in inside of a year at this point. So far, Johnson has mostly gone it alone. It has been a major personal investment. The 61-year-old hopes will pay off in his lifetime. If it doesn't, it won't be for a lack of trying. <laughs>
Steve Brassington is an independent electrical engineer. He's seen the machine and backs up everything John says. It's revolutionary. That's the only way to describe it. I think the, um, the technology, it's not bending physics, it's just using principles um, that I guess are, are commonly in use in power generation today in a different way. These guys have thought outside of the square. Basically it's magnetic attraction and magnetic repulsion that provide the movement or the moment of the, of the motor. Can you understand why some scientists are sceptical about it? There is no physicist or, or engineer who has looked at our, our um, motor or has looked at our figures who says it doesn't work. Lou is an electrician and John a businessman in Cairns in far north Queensland. The two unlikely inventors have been tinkering with their machine for six years. They've applied for an international patent and have been swamped by people wanting a piece of the action. The, uh, these are the coils, so we mentioned the coils don't get hot. Mm -hmm. Local businessman Alex Roma is one of the many offering money to help develop the generator. If it proves up to, uh, to be uh, what they say it is, it certainly would be something I'd uh, invest in. John has also spoken to millionaire inventor George Lewin, the man who came up with the Triton workbench and who's now setting up a fund to stop Australian inventions going overseas. There's an opportunity here, I think, to share an invention with the world um, that is beyond anything that we've ever contemplated before. Scientists here at the local university say while they're interested in John's machine, they're also cautious. They say if the machine can generate as much power as John says it can, then they will have to rewrite some of the laws of physics. And they've urged people to be cautious about investing in it until the generator has been independently tested. Anybody who says it doesn't work hasn't seen it or haven't, hasn't looked at our figures, they haven't reviewed it. If they look at it, they'll all agree with us that it does work. John says the household generator should be available in a year and sell for about $5,000. If he's right, it will make him much more. And how much do you think your technology could be worth to you? I have absolutely no idea. We could be talking about millions of dollars here? Yes. Oh, oh very definitely talking millions of dollars, but uh, I, uh, I'd hesitate to even take a, a stab at it. Mm, good idea. Because of your theory, several laws of physics may need to be re-examined. And then, Dr. E. L. Moraine, one of the men involved in the making of the atomic bomb, wrote, your project will lead to developments that would be beneficial to all mankind. And uh, Joseph Newman's work has been featured on national television and in hundreds of newspapers and magazines throughout the country. What's the answer to the energy crisis? Suppose a fellow told you the answer was in a machine he has developed. Before you scoff, take a look with Bruce Hall. In the backwoods of Mississippi, a mile down this dirt road, Past the keep out and no trespassing signs is the workshop of Joe Newman, a brilliant self-educated inventor who says he has developed a machine that could solve the energy crisis. Now back to Take Two on CNN. What if someone invented a machine that would make the gasoline engine obsolete? What if someone invented a machine that produced more energy than it used? And that energy is cheap, non-polluting, and safe. That person would probably be hailed as the greatest scientist since Einstein, with a discovery as important as electricity and as revolutionary as the wheel. Joseph Wesley Newman claims to have invented just such a machine. He says that his energy machine could power every American home, farm, business, automobile, and appliance with electricity at a fraction of the present cost. More than 30 scientists and technicians have tested the energy machine, and they agree it works. Right. Well, it's a fascinating story. Uh, first of all, if you can tell uh, stupid people like me as to sort of how this machine works. Okay, Dave, it's basically is that you're not creating anything. You're simply utilizing energy that prior to this time hasn't been understood. It took us several thousand years to ever put a water wheel in moving water. And basically what I'm doing is utilizing the energy in the magnetic field that consists of matter in motion, exactly like a moving river does. We are back. Well, would you welcome, please, Joseph Newman.
Nice to meet you. I appreciate you having me. Do you think your machine, if it can be commercially made available, can, for example, a person would buy a three or four hundred pound unit and all of a sudden would be able to produce all of the energy they need for their home? Is that certainly within the realm of possibility? Exactly. I have absolutely no doubt about it. That uh, such a device hooked to a home, a person will never have to pay for energy again. The device will be made uh, smaller as to put in an automobile, plane, spacecraft, you name it, this device. Using the atoms from the, from the magnetic field. And what you're doing is that you're converting mass into energy on a 100% conversion process. That's one of the first prototypes, and it, uh, that's a 700-pound magnetic rotor, and it's got uh, about 8,000 pounds of wire around it. Now, it's gone down. That unit there weighs 135 pounds, and I showed that at the Hilton in uh, New Orleans. There was approximately uh, 2,500 people attended, 1,000 people outside, and another 1,200, 1,500 standard to get in. And uh, it would demonstrate something like 25 times more out than externally and put it into the system. You get more wattage out of that than than what you'd, what you'd, put, than what you'd put in. In fact, a railback battery company is working with me now trying to design a battery to hold up to this recharging effect of this system. Because not only will it run the device, it'll put more energy back into the battery pack and came out of it. So you could... That's, that, that's fascinating. Uh, tell you what, it's, we could stay here all night. But there's a major stumbling block in getting this device to the public. The inventor can't let private industry have the machine until the patent is granted. But obtaining the patent seems to be almost impossible. Examples. December 1981, following the patent application, Joe Newman calls the patent office to talk with an examiner. He is told they don't want to talk to him. Newman protests to his congressman, and a meeting between the inventor and patent officers is arranged in Washington. But on January 6, 1982, Joe Newman receives a letter that says his patent has been totally denied. A hidden energy device is suspected. But the scheduled meeting on January 27th is held nevertheless, at which time the examiner told Mr. Newman, I don't think I'll ever be able to give you a patent, no matter what evidence you present to me. The, the reason for that statement? Science, patent examiners which, uh, felt that what Joe uh, Newman claimed was impossible. On March 13th, after more protests from the inventor, another meeting was convened. This time, he was told they believed there was no hidden energy device and added that they actually believed the machine worked. But now, they feel his technical description of his invention is inadequate. And, I, and then I asked him a second time, in fact. I said, you're saying that you agree that the energy out is greater than energy in? He said, he said uh, Mr. Newman, you say that it does. We looked at the facts. We believe you. Mr. Newman then protested to the Patent Office's Board of Appeals. A meeting is set for September 30th, 1982. Incredibly, at that meeting, Joe Newman is told the description of his invention is now adequate, but... Then they went back and started saying, we don't think that the device is now operable. And also at the time of this meeting, they gave me two minutes, two minutes at the very end of the discussion that they allowed me to get up and try to discuss eight, oh, at that time it was 17 years of work in two minutes. So in little less than a year, the U.S. Patent Office has told the man who just may have an amazing machine, number one, they didn't want to talk with him. Number two, they will never give him a patent. Number three, the invention has a hidden energy device. Number four, there is no hidden energy device. Your invention works, but your description of the invention is inadequate. And finally, your description is adequate. Your invention does not work. And now 31 people with scientific backgrounds have signed legal documents swearing to the machine's validity.